Good morning, and welcome to the Boneyard with Steve Robertson. As always, I am your good friend host, Steve Robertson, here on the magnificent Monday edition of the Yard. Hope you guys are well. Man, it feels so good to win. It does. It feels so good to win. There's not much that compares to that. It's true. A lot to talk about today. It's one of the reasons we're getting an early start. You know, early to bed, early to rise. I was up late Saturday night and then up early Sunday morning. So the good friend and host was was very tired yesterday. And I can only begin to imagine how it was for uh, your administration, your coaches, your players. And uh, I got a lot to say about what the debacle that happened at Duty Noble Field Friday night where uh, basically a game was taken out of the hands of the players uh, to satisfy the ego of uh, some administrator at the SEC Control Center. And so we're going we're gonna to speak about that. And uh, no, I'm not going to let it go just because we won the game on Sunday. And I don't think anybody else should either. I don't think the administration should let it go. I don't think the coaching staff should let it go. I don't think Greg Sankey should let it go. What happened – Saturday night can never happen again at a Southeastern Conference sporting event. Absolutely cannot happen, period. It's ridiculous. And so, no, we're not going to let it go. We're going to continue to be the squeaky wheel. Uh, you know, there's a lot – again, there's a lot I'm going to say. I'm going to save that for later in the show. We're going to break down the weekend. We're going to begin a, a journey into sound today with our top ten list as we do um, top ten rock songs from the 1960s. And Wednesday, we'll do 70s. And Friday, we'll close it out with a good time in the 80s. And then next week, we'll open up with the 90s. And, of course, 20s, uh, 2000s, and then 2010s. So there you go. That's that's your top 10 list for the next six shows. And I can tell you, it's been tough. It's been tough. It really has, putting this list together. It's been tough. I know I'm going to upset some people. And it's okay. It's a good dialogue. Uh, Also, it appears that Mississippi State should be okay with Chris Jans right now. Should be. Now, the way the game is played sometimes is an uncomfortable ride for fans. I mean, that's just kind of the reality of it, right? Because we love Mississippi State. We think everybody else should love Mississippi State. And anybody that is in our employment should want to stay here forever. That's not the reality of things. But, uh, of course, Chris Jan's name uh, linked to the Arkansas search that appears to be winding down in a surprising move. It appears they're going to lure John Calipari away from Kentucky. Now, there's going to be a lot of Kentucky fans that are happy to see him go. But it's just, uh, kind of an unprecedented event here is uh, Kentucky loses a head, fo- head basketball coach, their primary sport, uh, to a conference rival in many respects. And so uh, I don't know where Chris Jans would go. I do know that uh, he has had an extension or his agent has had an, a contract extension in hand for Mississippi State for some time, has not been agreed to just yet. And, again, that's his job's – his agent's job and again we went through all this with Dan Mullen right and um, I know some people don't like the comparison but it's true but it's every agent's job to get the best deal for their client no matter where that comes from and a lot of times too it's like hey let me go see what his value is so I can get the most lucrative contract extension I possibly can for my coach that's how the game is played it's uncomfortable for all of us but, um, you know, a lot of people that will be surprised to see him leave. Uh, I don't think he's here long term. I know some other people do. I, I don't. That's my opinion. I don't think he's here long term. Uh, but I do think that uh, we'll get an extension done. Uh, you know, of course, I'm sure somebody will float his name out there saying he's connected to Kentucky. I don't think it's a good fit at all. I've had somebody tell me that, uh, that Kentucky would love to get Billy Donovan, and wouldn't we all? I just don't see Billy Donovan coming back to college coaching. I guess it's possible. I mean, if you're going to come back, there's a lot worse places in the country to go than Kentucky. Uh, but it's a very interesting dynamic. But I wanted to get that out of the way because we're going to spend a lot of time today talking about baseball and talking about how uh, you know things kind of changed over the weekend uh, with the SEC standings. Uh, get up this morning. Your Bulldogs, your Diamond Dogs, ranked number 15 uh, by Baseball America. I know that Mississippi State won – a very important SEC series over the weekend against a very good Georgia team. Uh, A team, honestly, that I believe has the best lineup that we faced all year. I don't think there is a – there's a free out in that lineup. You know, you play A&M, you get through a Pell, you get through one, two, three, and four, and you feel like, hey, I think I'm okay. And maybe you can coast a little bit. But the problem is their top four are so good – 
Eventually, they're going to get you. may not be the first time through the order. may not be the second. But at some point, they get you. You know, Braden Montgomery, of course, having an incredible season. I know that stings. It does. We'd probably be a top five program right now, too, if we had Braden Montgomery. Uh, by the same token, you know, I look at that Florida lineup. You know, once you get through the four hole there, you think, you know, not a lot of depth here. You can find a way to get around CAGS. You got a chance to win the ball game, which is another reason why we should have swept that series. And I don't want to keep belaboring that point, but the reality of it is, is this Georgia lineup, it's really good. And they play in a launching pad, similar to Alex Box down there at Foley Field. They came on the road to Mississippi State and found out, as I put in a little hashtag in response to a Georgia fan, warning track Power Rangers. Yeah, it's true. And Charlie Condon's legit. Mississippi State did a good job against him. Charlie Condon. That guy's a polished hitter. He's a professional guy, for sure. Hey, let's thank our friends at Bulldog Burger Company. Longtime sponsors of this show. Man, I love Bulldog Burger Company. I do. I absolutely love Bulldog Burger Company. And uh, I suspect me and Brian Haydad were probably among their first 100 to 200 customers when we were in there pretty early, like right after they opened. And thought, you know what? This place is going to make it. It's really good. Atmosphere is good. Pricing's good. Service is great. Food is great. Uh, it's a great place to have a night out with friends or family. Three great locations to serve you. University Drive in Star Vegas, Gloucester Street there in Tupelo, Lake Harbor Drive in the Ridge and Flowood area. Man, I absolutely love going in there. I have the spring rolls as my appetizer just about every time. It's part of my beauty care regimen because those spring rolls make you and everybody around you better looking. Three great locations to serve you. University Drive in Stark Vegas, Gloucester Street there in Tupelo, Lake Harbor Drive in the Ridge and Flowood area. Get that chocolate shake to go. You know, I'm a big advocate for dessert to go. Life is what you make it. You got a little sweet tooth. Sometimes you got to take care of that. It's true. All right, let's go back and look at game two. And uh, I'm going to reserve some of my commentary about what I learned uh, for later in the show. But uh, let's get through the game. And uh, in our next segment, when we, we'll do this one. We'll do top ten, and then we'll we'll get into some other things. Okay, all right. So game number two, of course, State wins game one. You feel like okay, the pitching matchup certainly favored us on on Saturday. You feel like hey, we're good to go, man. We're good to go. Got Gerangelo on the bump. Uh, they got a kid out there that's uh, been somewhat prone to the uh, long ball there in Leighton Finley. It favors if even the, even the Georgia fans said, you know what, this is going to be a tough one. They thought they'd they'd win Friday Sunday. They didn't think they'd win on Saturday. Turns out they did, uh, thanks to uh, the SEC office. But um, but let's run it back, shall we? All right. So Slate offered our former Diamond Dog player, and listen, I, I get it. There were a lot of people really, 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 really upset about all this stuff. And uh, listen, I hope now we can just kind of move on from this. You know. Uh, but Slate Offord moved up to lead off in game two. Also um, moved around the diamond a little bit, you know, defensively, as, as you'll find. Uh, but Offord opens the ball game with a single to the right side there. One of his few hits, I believe he went 3-13 and 13 on the weekend. I believe it's correct, 3-13. and 13. Uh, And then Condon lines out to the shortstop. Really nice play there. And then Corey Collins, who is a guy we talked a little bit about on the show in our preview, was a guy that was kind of like a snake laying in the reeds, man. I talked to some Georgia people, and they said, you know, he struggled a little bit early on, and they weren't sure you know, where he fit defensively. They had to get him in there. And, uh, you know, Charlie was hitting a lot of so, you know solo home runs. They were trying to get somebody on base in front of Charlie, give him a chance to impact the game more. Uh, but Collins hitting third this day and uh, doubles down the right field line, pushes off to third. And then we hit Logan Jordan with the pitch to load the bases. And you're thinking, here we go. And we've been through this with Gerangelo before. Like, he, t- he at times he'll have some first inning trouble. But once he works through that, he's typically fine. I always feel like if we get a one, two, three inning from Gerangelo in the first, it's probably going to be a Bulldog win. And this is, again, it's interesting how it works. He has some first inning trouble. We get a loss, but really through no fault of his. Trey Phelps, who had a great weekend for Georgia, freshman outfielder, not so much defensively, but really good weekend to play. Singles to left field, drives in a run. And you've got a chance here for them to bring this thing open, right? You needed a non-productive out here. You, you trade the run for an out, but you really want to get a non-productive out here. And we get it by way of strikeout as Gerangelo gets uh, Colby Branch, really good hitter, to strike out, swinging. And then Chadwick lines out to center field. 
And so not only do we get the non-productive out, and it's incredible how the, the pressure shifts in a ball game. When you get the bases loaded with less than two outs, all of the pressure is really on the defense. Because there's so many ways to score. You can walk a guy in. You can be a sack fly. You can get, you know, uh, sometimes a ground ball to the right side bar, and it's not a, a double play ball. You can get the run home. Uh, of course, a base hit. There's just a variety of ways you can score. But when you get that second out, as we got with Branch, then you need the base hit or a wild pitch. And there's only two ways you're going to score there, right? Uh, the base hit, the wild pitch, or, you know, you know walk. Something to force a run in. You're not going to get a productive out with two outs because the inning is over. And so it's amazing, and you can see it happen in our own countenance when, when Mississippi State loads the bases. It's like, okay, we need a big hit here. But when they get to two outs and the bases are still loaded, it always feels like, you know what, hey, the pressure is all on us at that point. It, it really shifts. And so it's a huge strikeout for Gerangelo. And, again, it just kind of opens things up there for, you know, you let your defense make a play here. And we do. So top of one, we navigate through a, a, a tough stretch there and just give up the one run. That was a win for us. All right, bottom of one, Stay goes one, two, three. Amani grounds out the second. Marshawn grounds out the short. Uh, DJ strikes out looking. Tough weekend for DJ. I mean, he had a couple big hits at times, but uh, he saw tons of sliders, and they were really mixing and matching with him too. It's like – I, I just I don't know who makes these decisions. I assume it's Jake, but I I, I would love to just tell DJ, hey, listen, you're not going to get a two zero fastball. It's never going to happen. It's never you're never going to get a two zero fastball in this league, because everybody knows if they give you a two zero fastball, you're going to knock it five hundred and seventy five thousand feet. And so we got to go up there looking breaking ball. We do. And and the thing that I always say about that is, if it's not one that you can hammer, let it go. Just take it for a strike. You got three to work with. But uh, tough weekend for DJ for the most part. But again, some big hits on on uh, on Sunday. All right, top of second, Gerangelo comes down here, strikes out the side, gets Gonzalez swinging, Morello looking, and then Alford swinging, and the crowd cheered. All right, bottom of second, State finally comes through with a hit here. Uh, Hines strikes out swinging, Hyzak strikes out looking, and they were really spotting up those breaking balls. Not and, and Hyzak is a guy too that people are having to pay a little attention to. We discussed this a little bit on Friday's show, but uh, I've got the numbers in front of me. In SEC play, among the regulars, Connor Hyzak leads the Mississippi State Bulldogs in SEC play. In 12 games, he is hitting 362. 362. He's got four home runs, 13 RBI, which is near the lead in both. He leads the team in RBI against SEC pitching, and he's second in home runs. How about that? Were you expecting to hear that? And again, this move was made down in Biloxi, and uh, that's when Hunter really got hot right after that. Now people are pitching a little bit different. But Connor Hyzak, among the Bulldog regulars, leading the team against SEC play, slugging 702. That's nuts, man. His on-base percentage is 444. And then there's Bryce Chance, a guy that many people had kind of given up on, him, and we moved him. Out of the lineup for a while, put him in as a DH. He earned his job back against SEC pitching. Bryce Chance is hitting 351. Just some food for thought there. You know, just some food for thought. All right, so Chance, of course, singles to the right side here for our first hit. And then downs, uh, grounds out to the third base, uh, Aaron DHing for us on uh, Saturday. So we get the first hit, but can't really do anything with it. Against a two out hit there. Uh, but it's good to kind of get something going. And Gerangelo just continues to roll right here. He gets Charlie Condon in a lengthy at bat strikeout swinging. He gets Cowan strikeout swinging, and then uh, Jordan strikes out looking. So that's getting it done right there. You know, it's like you go back and look here. Okay, you get you get Branch to strikeout swinging in the back in the first, and then six of the next seven are strikeouts. So seven of eight. You felt really good about how things were going, Gerangelo. It's like if we can get the lead, we can probably hold it. All right, bottom of third, we do. Logan Kohler, who was really unfairly maligned in all this, and we'll get to that later in the show. Logan Kohler singles to center field, and that opens the rally here. Because Johnny Long, even though it's a sack bunt situation and runs are going to come at a premium, Johnny's bunting for a hit, and he makes it. 
Amani Larry then gets a sack bun down, moves those runners in a scoring position, and then they walk Marshawn lengthy at bat here. Wedding thing intentional. So now bases are loaded with, with one out, and DJ comes up and singles to left field and two run score. And uh, that's how it works. And then Mersh gets picked off at second. That just can't happen. I mean, and that you, you expect so much more from David because he's such an elite base runner. And but you got to afford a little grace at times. But that was a huge, 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 huge point in the ball game. But State gets the lead two one. Could have been a bigger inning. Turns out that it was. All right, top of four. Um, we ground they, they, Trey Phelps. Hits a ground ball out to second base. They initially rule him out at first. And the crowd went crazy in Georgia challenges, and they do reverse it. Replay did show that Phelps did beat it. And then uh, Branch pops the bun up, and Johnny Long, great play behind the plate, makes the catch. Chadwick then uh, grounds over to third, and we force the runner at second. Can't get two. And then Gonzalez grounds back towards the middle, and we force the runner at second. So... Uh, you give off the leadoff single there. Give up the leadoff single, but uh, get they get nothing from it. And, again, everybody understands runs are going to be at a premium. So you're playing for one almost every inning. Bottom of four, Hyzak flies out down the right field line, hit the ball pretty well there. Uh, Chanson flies out the center and downs, grounds out to second. So it's a one, two, three inning there in the fourth. But State has to lead. But you know that two runs, you're not going to be able to win this ball game. All right, top of five, Morella, who had a pretty good weekend for Georgia too, he flies out the center. Slate Offord strikes out swinging again. And then Condon homers down the left field line. And uh, it was just a matter as if it was going to be fair or foul. But it's really kind of a best-case scenario for State with Charlie Condon swinging with the bases empty and two outs, right? You're fine to challenge him there. It was really one of the only highlights Charlie Condon had on the weekend. And Collins flies out the center. But it's a 2-2 ball game ahead of the bottom of five. Logan Kohler flies out the center, and then Long flies out. And they bring in Zeldin, who is their best reliever. And I thought it was a little bit early, but I thought, you know what, this is West just trying to keep the game where it is, hoping that when Gerangelo comes out, that the net change is a negative for us. And then Zeldin gets Larry to strike out swinging. So we get to the bottom of uh, top of six, excuse me. We bring in Tyson Harden, and uh, Durangelo was around 93, 95 pitches. We'll double check that when we do our numbers here. But uh, then Logan Jordan singles to the right side. You're thinking, oh my gosh, here we go. But Tyson's been so good as of late. Phelps then uh, flies out to center field, and then Colby Branch, again, really good hitter, grounds out into the double play, 5 uh, 4 3 to get out of the inning. And that's Tyson Harden's game. This is a guy that has a lot of sink on the fastball, throws a true sinker, throws a slider. He is a completely different pitcher than he was last year. And that's a guy out there when you need a ground ball, Tyson Harden's a guy to go to. All right, bottom of six, chance for us to do something here and we don't. And these, these are the kinds of things that infuriate you, right? So Mershon is hit by the pitch. So you get the leadoff runner on with three and four and five coming up. Our three big guns. And then DJ strikes out swinging, Hines strikes out looking, and then Hyzak flies out to center. A lot of sliders to both sides of the plate. We didn't get a lot of center cut fastballs. They didn't really challenge us. They were going to make us hit breaking stuff, and we struggled to do it. And, uh, again, you get the leadoff runner on here, and uh, he never advances. Really thought we should try to swing to uh, steal bases here. Gonzalez couldn't throw us out. I mean, we, we talked about the, the stolen base numbers on Friday's show. I really think, and I get it, DJ and Hines are coming up, but how many times have we stolen with DJ up there and been able to get the base hit and score him from second? I, I thought we should have been a little more aggressive on the base pass here. Uh, top of seven, Chadwick grounds out the first unassisted. Uh, Gonzalez, the aforementioned Gonzalez, flies out to uh, Dave Marchand in short center field. Morello walks and then offer grounds out to the shortstop. And so you get through 8-9-1 here, and again, the two-out walk is, you know, not ideal because you don't want to flip the order for them. But uh, it worked out okay for us because, you know, Slate was hit leadoff. And, um, you, know, you know, you know the guy was, you know, really elevated emotionally trying to make an impact in this, in this series. Uh, didn't work out the way that I think he'd hoped. But um, all right, bottom of seven, Bryce grounds out to the shortstop. They bring in Jackson McKenzie to hit for downs. And uh, kind of a tough situation here. I mean, and, I mean, it really is. I mean, you're cold to you come in and um, – you know, strikes out swinging, and uh, it was not a competitive at bat. I mean, it really wasn't. Jackson McKenzie's a guy that's going to be our first baseman next year. We've got to get him some A-Bs. 
And then Logan Culver comes in here with two outs, tries to start a little rally here. And uh, crazy thing here, it's a fly ball out there, should have been caught. They lose it, and it bounces over the fence for a ground rule double. And then Johnny Long walks. So now all of a sudden, not only do you have a runner in scoring position, you've got two men on, and you've turned the lineup over, and then Amani lines out. Lengthy at bat here. He lines out to left field. Man, we really need to get that, that thing down. You know, we really did. Could, couldn't get it done, though. All right, we bring in uh, Nolan Stevens in place of Tyson Harton here, top of eight. We get Charlie Condon to strike out, strike out swinging. I don't know if anybody in the country has done a better job against Charlie Condon than Mississippi State. And that says a lot about Justin Parker and these young men buying into the game plan. Really did a good job against him. Collins and flies out to left, and then we kind of pitch ourselves into a bit of a jam here. We walk Jordan. Again, a two-out walk, lengthy at bat there, but we're up in that count one-two. We end up walking him. And then this is when the craziness happens, right? This is when it happens. And there's so many things. You say, well, if this hadn't happened, you know, hey, we get Logan Jordan out. It doesn't matter. Nothing else happens, right? So you get this uh, really well-struck ball from Trey Phelps, and it's kind of tailing away from the center fielder, but not enough into DJ. Just a great hit. And Connor Hyzak gets to it quick. And makes a great throw to Amani Larry, who doesn't have the best arm. But, man, on this play here, he throws it accurately. And uh, one of the things, young kids, you young baseball guys, there's a drill you need to get comfortable with now, and that's learning to catch the ball glove side on the relay. When I coached high school baseball, we, we used to have races, relay races with that, teaching guys to throw the ball glove side, catch the ball glove side, and be in a position to throw that relay home. And Amani executes it perfectly. The guy is going to be out by a ways. And a lot of craziness happens here. Obviously, he is out. And uh, I, I was told yesterday that um, he kind of stumbled into the slide and made contact with Johnny's knee, which is true. But uh, playing catcher contact is unavoidable. Um, but let me just go ahead and tell you this. Johnny Long was wrong for how he reacted. He was. He was wrong. He's a, he's a very... Let's say high-strung kid on the diamond. And I don't know what he was thinking, but his reaction was completely wrong. He deserved to be ejected. Uh, I thought the officials and our players did a great job not letting the situation escalate, even though the bench is clear. And you can say, you know what, hey, if Johnny Long doesn't do that, the benches don't clear, everything is okay. And that's true. It's true. But every bit of that... There is blame to go around for everybody. We're not going to pin all this on Johnny Long. But all that understood, Johnny deserved to be ejected. You can't get up and knee a guy in the ribs. You can't. Now, when I first saw him kind of riding the runner, that's just good catching technique, right? You want to make sure that you shield him from the plate. The umpire sees that you've made the tag there. You get that, that your throwing hand in the mitt and on the ball to make sure they don't rake it out. And if you look at the replay – and maybe it's just kind of by coincidence. It looks like Dylan Carter, because of the way he's sliding, it looks like he's trying to, to kind of pull it out there. But no matter what he did, there was no excuse for what Johnny did. And, uh, and I love Johnny, and you all love Johnny. But Johnny made a mistake here. He's acknowledged that mistake, uh, tweeted out a very heartfelt statement yesterday. And, you know, being around the players, I can tell you that uh, they love Johnny. They were chanting free Johnny. Uh, in the locker room uh, post game on uh, Sunday. But uh, I want to read you the statement from Johnny in case you've missed it, because maybe you have. Maybe, you're, maybe you, you spent the weekend on, um, on the water or in the yard. But here's what Johnny had to say. I strive to play this game with grit, passion, and integrity. Last night, following a highly competitive play at the plate with the game on the line, I let my emotions and adrenaline get the best of me. My actions were not reflective of my true character. It was crushing to not be out there with my teammates today, but I take full responsibility for my mistake. I am proud to be a Mississippi State Bulldog. I love our team, our program, and our community, and will do nothing short of giving my absolute best for the M over S every single day to help my teammates to victory. Hell State Johnny Long. Absolutely the right thing to say. Acknowledge the mistake. Let's all move forward. And, again, I'm, I'm going to get later in the show, we're going to get through top ten, I'm, I'm going to address – what happened 
with all of this stuff at the control center, what happened post game. Okay, I promise. But again, there's no defending what Johnny did. I know some some people have tried, right? Uh, but you can't do that. You can't do that. And it was reviewed for malicious contact. The SEC office says no. Our crowd cheers. Uh, the call of out is upheld, and then they go back in review, and then the chaos occurs. But let's get through our game recap, and then we'll get to that stuff. Um, so what, what, what sucks about this the most, uh, to me, is that we have made an emotional play. We have stolen the momentum. We've gotten the crowd ignited, and we have two, three, and four coming up in the eighth. You just push your run across there, close it out, and ninth ball game's over, Right. And how many times have we seen it, the dude effect, right? There's a big play, and all of a sudden the crowd just kind of wills the team to victory. It felt like that was going to happen. When that ball got in the gap, I'm thinking, this is trouble. And then we throw the guy at the plate. If we just throw him out and walk off the field and celebrate with the teammates, I suspect we win the ball game here. I, I do. And, again, I'm not pinning that just on Johnny Long. Everybody is responsible for their own actions. And uh, even though Johnny Long did something that he absolutely should not have done, that does not excuse what the SEC Control Center did. And, again, more on that later. All right, bottom of eight, it, every team is impacted here. And what do you know? Dave Marchand comes through with a single through the right side there. And that's what I'm thinking. Hey, look, we got to get this run home before we get too deep in the order because of the fact that we've got some guys that aren't used to swinging a bat. And to be honest with you, I thought we absolutely should have stolen base here. Absolutely. Absolutely should have stolen base here. Uh, Steven Spalletta hits uh, in Dakota Jordan's spot. He grounds out the first base unassisted. Marshawn goes to second. And again, here we are, lengthy at bat. If we, uh, if we steal the base here, and I believe we could have, then all of a sudden we're third here right, on the ground out. And of course, you know, transitive properties don't always commute. But I thought maybe we're a little bit starstruck here. Maybe just kind of in, in shock and in the moment, thinking, what are we going to do? How are we going to win this game? You still got to go coach a baseball game. You still got to go win the game. So Splatter grounds out to first. And then uh, Nate Chester hits for Hunter Hines and grounds out to third. They intentionally walk Isaac, as they should have, because he is probably the only guy in the order that could probably hit a tank at that point. Uh, I guess Nolan Stevens could have too. And so Nolan Stevens hits for uh, Bryce Chance and then strikes out swinging. And that was our last best chance to win the ball game. It was. Based on the circumstances we had, we get the runner on, we can't get him around. And it's not like we had some guys that didn't have uh, some ABs under their belt either come up to, to swing. But uh, it's 2 2. Top of now, we bring in Kem Schulke, our dog. Love that kid, man. And uh, you got Luke Dodson playing right field. You've got uh, Joe Powell behind the plate for Johnny, of course, and you know Chester goes to second. It's just nuts, man. And then the, the craziest thing to me is Cal Steven, who threw 100 pitches Friday nights playing left. But wait, it gets crazier. Uh, Colby Branch grounds out to second. Nice play by Chester. And then Chadwick homers down the right field line. Proved to be the, you know, the big deal. Zeldin, the pitcher, ends up hitting for himself, strikes out swinging. And then Morello um, out at first. But uh, at this point, there was not much hope for Mississippi State. Now, granted, you never know when somebody's going to run into something. But McKenzie strikes out looking. Dotson strikes out looking. Uh, Powell then singles through the left side, but you knew he needed to hit a tank right there because Cal Steven had to come up and, uh, and swing and strikes out on three pitches. And uh, give him credit for going out there and trying to win for this ball game, win this, team for his, win this game for his team. But uh, what happened was absolutely ridiculous. And, um, but that's the game. And uh, it was basically gifted to Georgia by the uh, SEC office. Let's look inside the numbers here. Uh, Slate Offer goes one for four. Charlie Condon goes one for four. Both of those guys also with a pair of strikeouts. But look at Mississippi State's numbers. Amani goes 0 for three. And uh, kind of a rarity for him not to reach base, but he didn't. Uh, Dave Marchand goes one for two. Also had a walk in the ball game. Dakota Jordan uh, one for three with a couple of RBI. The only two runs the state scored. Hunter Hines goes 0 for three with three strikeouts. Connor Isaac 0 for three in that ball game. Uh, does have a walk. Bryce Chance goes one for three. The state only had seven hits in the game, and uh, it's interesting. You know, Johnny Long and Joe Powell both get get hits, and Joe Joe Powell had seen live pitching in forever. Uh, so. 
Uh, pitching side, Gerangelo goes five innings, has 93 pitches, five hits, two runs. Thought he did well. They did a good job fouling some pitches off to kind of elevate the pitch count there, but eight strikeouts against no walks. He did have one HBP. It's good to see him put up a zero in the walks, though. It's been a bit of a challenge for him. Uh, Tyson Harden, again, really good. Two innings pitch, one hit, one walk, and uh, got that big ground out uh, to force the double play. Nolan Stevens, one inning pitch, one hit, uh, one punch out, one walk there. And uh, we would navigate that without a lot of trouble. And then, of course, Cam Schulke just leaves one up here. You hate it for Cam under the circumstances. And I can promise you nobody wanted to win more than him. Uh, goes to one inning and is tagged with the loss. One hit, one run. Gives up a solo shot. And especially as well as he pitched on Friday. You know, you hated to see it for him. But uh, we win the series. And we'll get to that uh, momentarily after we get through our our top ten list. But um, – and again, I got so much more to say. I know you're like you're waiting for me to explode. That's going to happen later in the show. All right, time for today's top ten list. As always, brought to you by CloseWithBlair.com. That's C L O S E with Blair, B L A I R dot com. Blair is a mortgage professional. There's a lot of people in the mortgage industry. He's been doing it 23 years. Nobody stays in any industry 20 plus years without doing a great job. It's true. Blair's also a bulldog. I like to keep business in the family whenever we can because I know that if I do do business at Bulldogs, there's a chance it's going to go back to Mississippi State. Whether I go to the Bulldog Initiative or season tickets or merchandising sales, I like to keep it in the family. That's my attitude. Now, Blair's the kind of guy that will work with anybody because, hey, the bottom line is this, is the dream of home ownership has eluded a lot of people. Maybe you're looking for a game day condo. Maybe you're looking for your first home, and you don't know where to turn. I'm here to tell you, go to work with Blair. Give them a call at 601-500-2344, licensed in several states. So if you're a, a college student or a newlywed and you're just kind of making your way in life for the first time, there's a lot of questions. You know, this whole thing about becoming an adult can be very difficult. These are adult decisions, right? Don't make an emotional one. Stick with a winner like Blair Chandler. Again, it's closed with Blair for a reason. Be sure and tell them you heard about him on the Boneyard. We've had several Boneyard listeners that have closed loans with Blair. Again, 601-500-2344. All right, it's time for our journey into sound. And I'll tell you, this was tough. It really was. And so let me give you the parameters of our list here. We're not going to rank them in the order that I love them. We're going to rank them chronologically, right? We're going to do top rock songs from the 1960s today. There's going to be a lot of great songs that are left out because we can only pick one song per year. One song per year. And so there are a few bands that uh, were very, 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 very instrumental in changing rock music. This is a decade where the, the quality of music really changed because, you know, in the 50s, you kind of had the doo-wop sound. Now, I didn't include the Beach Boys in my list, and they had a ton of number one hits. They did. I just don't really see them as a rock band. I know other people may. I don't. Also, didn't include Cream, which is a shame, but I wanted to give them a, a shout-out. Didn't include the band. Uh, we did include some other names you know. We didn't include MC5, even though Kick Out the Jams is one of those songs that really changed a lot. And MC5, a lot of people don't understand. The rock scene in Detroit was one of the most instrumental in changing the direction of American rock music. They call it Detroit Rock City for a reason. Now, of course, the city's changed a lot since then. But you had MC5 and Ted Nugent. Uh, you had Izzy and the Stooges. You had Alice Cooper. Bob Seger. A lot of people from that great area. Even Grand Funk Railroad from down the road at Flint uh, did some cool things. But uh, the rock scene in Michigan was incredible. Absolutely incredible. And it really kind of came of age here in the 1960s. And so I wanted to give a shout out because everybody knows the great track, Detroit Rock City from Kiss. It's really kind of paying homage in some respects to the Detroit rock scene. And again, that kick out the jams from MC5, man. That, there's so many bands out there that I'll tell you. MC5, their irreverence is one of the things that changed rock and roll. So again, we start the decade uh, with... Again, the doo-wop sound is there, but you're starting to hear more instrumentation where you're starting to hear a little more of an edge in guitar uh, and song composition. So number 
I guess it's not number number one, but from 1960, I want to highlight a, a young man, not young anymore, but he was absolutely incredible. And um, you've heard this song before, and it really kind of blends the harmonies and the big chorus, and you start to hear a little bit more of guitar as the featured instrument. And uh, this is a you know a, a gentleman too that I, you've heard this song a million times, but the vocal delivery had a little bit of grit to it, and I, lo- I love it. And uh, it's impossible to ignore uh, the impact that players like Chuck Berry uh, had on rock music. Of course, most of that happened in the 50s, you know, with Johnny Be Good and things of that nature. Uh, and I told you guys before, Chuck Berry, in many respects, is kind of the father of rock and roll. Barrett Strong kind of followed a little bit in those uh, same footsteps. Remember, from 1960, it's Barrett Strong's Money, That's What I Want. That's the, your song from 1960. Now, 1961, again, the doo-wop sound was still somewhat prevalent, but you were beginning to hear and see songs performed about some topics that were a little more risque in some respects. And Dion and the Belmonts had a great track called Run Around Sue, the cautionary tale, one of the greatest uh, songs, won a Grammy, right? Uh about a girl that uh, couldn't be faithful. It's ironic, too, that Dion had a big hit, too, called The Wanderer. It kind of shows the duality of man, that he was, uh, in one song, talking about promiscuity of his own, and another, talking about the promiscuity of a girlfriend. But, uh, again, music was beginning to change. We could not put a list together, even though that uh, much of his heyday was in the 1950s, uh, without mentioning Elvis Presley. Your 1962 song is Return to Cinder. And I don't know if you've, if you've ever taken the time to look at all of the albums that were released by Elvis Presley in the 1960s. It's absolutely incredible how much they wrote him. There were so many other bands that would do an album like every year, every couple years. There were some years where Elvis Presley did two or three a year. And sometimes they were motion picture soundtracks because Elvis became became an actor. Other times they were EPs. There would be just a 45 that was released. But it is incredible the volume of material that was released by Elvis Presley in the 1960s. And Return to Cinder, one of his best hits of the early 60s. And um, again, I go back to the late 50s with Jailhouse Rock. I mean, just absolutely incredible. The song's been covered by a lot of people. All right, 1963. This may be a surprise pick for some people. One of the reasons that I went with this one is because the guitar began to get a little less filtered. And I went with the Kingsman for Louie Louie, kind of an irreverent song. The vocal delivery is not what you heard in the 1950s. I mean, you didn't have Pat Boone and people up there singing Ricky Nelson. It wasn't these crooners. All of a sudden, you had kind of this raw guitar sound, and you had a vocalist that had a little more grit in their voice. So things, again, beginning to change. And the music at the end of the 1960s was light years different than it was in the early 60s. And this is where I think things really began to change. All right, 1964, the Beatles showed up in 1964 and played a uh, a set on the Ed Sullivan Show. And uh, one of the most famous songs from that TV appearance is I Want to Hold Your Hand. And again, now all of a sudden, you don't just have studio musicians that are playing and a guy being a studio performer. And most of the live performances back then on television were just some guy go up there and singing along and lip lip syncing to a record. The Beatles went out there and did it live. And it really changed American music in many respects when the Beatles came over. 64, huge, huge year in, in rock and roll. And uh, the Beatles were really ushering that in. And, of course, the longer their catalog developed, uh, the more raw and revolutionary their sound became. 1965, we would be remiss if we did not include the Rolling Stones. Uh, could have done it in 64 with Time is on my side. And again, even though it's not really what the Stones are known for, right? That was kind of like, again, kind of in the uh, you know, the last throes of that doo-wop crooner era in many respects. But in 1965, the Rolling Stones released arguably their most recognizable song. It's Satisfaction. I can't get no satisfaction in 65. And you had Keith Richards out there just absolutely laying down some incredible guitar tracks. And again, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones ushered in a new era in American music. 
all of a sudden we weren't all snapping our fingers and doo wopping and things of that nature. Things were really beginning to change. All right, 1966, and again, a song, too, where you began to see a lot of fun in music, but there was also more reverence in music. And then this is a song, too, where the vocal delivery in and of itself is not remarkable, other than the fact that it was unlike anything else at the time. It's the Trog's Wild Thing, because I think I love you. I do. Sam Kennison, of course, recorded his own version of this much later on the album Have You Seen Me Lately? But all of a sudden, there was room for people that were, for a, were a little bit different. They didn't have this buttoned-up image. All of a sudden, you could get out there and you could sing about things that uh, may have more of an adult theme to it. You know, They were still very protective of that. The FCC wouldn't allow many albums to be played uh, during daylight hours. You go and play certain songs at night. Uh, but the Trogs, a one-hit wonder with Wild Thing in 66, I think, again, you're beginning to see the development of rock and roll here. You're beginning to see things change. All right, 1967, huge year. Huge year in music. You know, we had the Jefferson Airplane. We had so many other bands out there. You had the Hate ashbury thing. You had uh, the Zombies. You had the Turtles. You had the Birds. There were so many bands out there doing some songs that were very, 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 very important to people that were part of revolutionary change in many respects in the United States. The hate ashbury scene was, was off the chain. And uh, you had all this psychedelic stuff. You had people, of course, that um, you know, were experimenting with LSD and drugs and narcotics. And you know, it's peace and love and good harmony and things like that. And then there was an African-American guy that showed up that changed the way we thought about rock music. A guy that changed the way that we viewed guitar playing. That's Jimi Hendrix. And so in 1967, of course, he absolutely set the world on fire when uh, he was at the Monterey Pop Festival. But uh, Purple Haze was released by the Jimi Hendrix Experience in 1967. Jimi Hendrix, one of the coolest people to ever walk this planet. And uh, I don't know that he gets enough respect. He gets a ton. Doesn't get enough. The things that he was doing. I mean, Jimi Hendrix was so broke, right? He had the only money, He bought a, a Fender Strat from a pawn shop, a right-handed Fender Strat, and then turned it upside down and, and, and corded it and strung it to be a left-handed player. It's uh, pretty interesting to see how that works. So Jimi Hendrix from 1967, Purple Haze. Number 68, another icon in American music in many respects, Jim Morrison from The Doors. Again, psychedelic rock kind of fueled the fire here. But uh, Morrison, of course, uh, lived hard and died quickly. But we would be remiss if not we'd mentioning the doors uh, that really kind of changed so many things in the United States. And uh, Jim Morrison, of course, so many people have evoked the spirit of Jim Morrison over the years, kind of mimicking what he did uh, as a front man. He was so incredibly shy in the beginning, he couldn't even face the crowd. He didn't develop confidence until much later. They were a live band, and Robbie Krieger and those guys had to convince him, hey, turn around, man. Jim, the, the crowd loves you. Turn around, turn around, and he did. And if you've never seen the movie The Doors by Oliver Stone with Val Kilmer playing Jim Morrison, I suggest that you do so. 1969, one of the most significant bands in the history of the world's rock and roll music hit the scene with Led Zeppelin 1. What's interesting, too, is Led Zeppelin 1 and 2 both came out in 1969. So we had a chance to pick here, but I went with the lead track on the very first Led Zeppelin album. Led Zeppelin 1, it's good times, bad times. You know I've had my share. All of a sudden, you had this incredible blend of a little bit of the Hate ashbury stuff, and some of that came across in the fashion and, you know, and, and the sentiment of the music. But you also had this British element two and of course we're going to get into on wednesday show we're going to get into black sabbath but there was something happening in england a kind of across the pond of course you know the, the stones and the beatles things are much different with them they were a little more in many respects accepted but there was a harder image and a harder edge to music that was coming thanks in large part to kind of a second British invasion. And Led Zeppelin, of course, one of the most covered bands of all time, one of the most influential bands of all time. That closes out the decade with Led Zeppelin. And uh, one of the things on our parameters here, I didn't want to repeat 
an artist because we could have easily just put together a list of Beatles songs per year. We could just about done that with the Rolling Stones per year or Elvis Presley. But I wanted to highlight as many of these classic artists as we could, but also to some bands that maybe weren't influential for very long, but they included some songs and produced some tracks that really changed the way that rock radio worked. And so that's our list for the day. It's a lot of fun putting this stuff together. And of course, somebody's going to say, Steve, you blew it. You should have included this song. I can't argue against that because hey, we're picking one song per year over one of the uh, greatest decades of music. And of course, you had Woodstock and it was just so many things that were happening in music and in this country. And I think one of the reasons so many of those songs are still anthemic is because so much of it was written as the genuine article. It wasn't written just to sell records. There were so many people, singer-songwriters, that had a message. They had something to share uh, to ensure that the people of America uh, had something to feel empowered about. We were in crisis. We were in the middle of the Vietnam War. Uh, the country was torn apart politically in many respects. And there were so many people out there that had something to say. And the reason that music has endured is because their message was pure and from the heart. It wasn't written uh, for the sake of shock value. It was very difficult to get a record deal back in those days. Uh, and these guys did. And uh, some incredible bands here. But, uh, so from Barrett Strong to Led Zeppelin, that's our list today. I hope you enjoy our series. We're very committed to this. And uh, I want to thank everybody for their support. A lot of people send me their suggestions you know, for certain years. And um, to be fair, I didn't use any of them. I wanted to do this myself. But uh, I do appreciate your solicitations because I may miss something. I may miss something. And I know, again, you had to throw a ball into Cream and Eric Clapton. You did. You had to throw a ball into the band and Levon Helm, Robbie Robertson, and all those guys. Uh, it's incredible. But uh, the 70s is going to be very interesting, too. And uh, we'll get into those guys on Wednesday. But what's interesting about the 70s, and I, I've shared this with so many people over the years. People are like, man, that 70s sound has kind of made a comeback. I said, yeah, the difference is those guys in the 70s could really play. That's what's so incredible to me is the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and the Doors and Jimi Hendrix, they basically spawned a movement that all of a sudden people wanted to play music. All of a sudden people went and bought guitars and not just acoustic guitars, but electric guitars and they formed bands and they, they really changed popular culture in the United States. And this was the genesis of so much of that. So thanks as always for your support of the top 10 list. If you have an idea, hit up Roy Samanti, my friend, who brought a cowbell and his daughter to uh, Duty Noble Field on Sunday to support our Diamond Dogs. Happy to see it. You can follow uh, Roy on Twitter at Dogmatic67. That's D-A-W-G-M-A-T-I-C-6-7. And our great list will also appear on Spotify. And, uh, hey, if you don't mind, give us a share every once in a while. Yeah, we, we really appreciate the music. This is not monetized in any way whatsoever. We're not getting paid anything uh, for these lists. Uh, you know, of course, we have a sponsor to sponsor to segment. But uh, when, you know, when you share the joy of music, you're sharing a good thing. Um, but I would be remiss, too. And I've said it like four times now. I apologize. But um, bad news yesterday when I got home and uh, I found out that C.J. Snare from Firehouse uh, passed away. C.J. had had abdominal surgery recently and they believe he died from complications from that. And uh, we thought he was recovering well. But um, we have some mutual friends. My friend Steve Blaze, Willie Nax, is uh, great friends with CJ, and I need to text Steve and uh, offer my condolences. But uh, it's interesting, too. When Dana was out in New Mexico, I was trying to do some as many things as I could, you know, to be sweet and everything else. And uh, uh, Firehouse has been important to us. It was part of our, our love story in the beginning. And uh, so I was going to get CJ Snare to do a video for me on Cameo, and I reached out to a mutual friend and said, hey, I don't know how long it takes for him to do this, but hey, could you, do you mind sending him a text and say, hey, this is my friend? And so not only did he give me a minute, he gave me over two minutes and uh, was amazing, even sang on the video. And I've shared that on Twitter and Facebook. And then CJ messaged me and, um, and shared some really cool things and um, invited us to a show in Philadelphia. And unfortunately, we weren't able to make it. And uh, Philadelphia, Mississippi, that was. And... Um, and that's something that I'll probably regret. I've seen those guys, I think, seven times. I think that's correct. But uh, Firehouse, one of my favorite bands. I have every album. I, I have them all. And uh, it's, a, it's a sad day. There's so many of you that had love. Bulldog fans, many of us grew up in a time 
We didn't lock our doors. We didn't feel the need to. We didn't have a need to. But the world is a much different place today than it was when we were much younger. Surely you've seen your neighbors have these video doorbells and things of that nature. You can have the same peace of mind, but also the convenience that you grew up with, with our friends at Eufy. That's E-U-F-Y. Very, 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 very simple product here. Very easy to install, and you set it up with just a Phillips screwdriver. No drilling required, no power tools, anything like that. You get the keyless entry. You don't have to fumble around with the keys when you got your hands full. You never have to worry about your kids losing their keys. Or perhaps you've got a rental property and you worry about people passing that key around. You also don't have the anxiety of having this battery that goes down on you. It's Guys, you got four months of power here, and you get a low battery notification before it runs out so you can charge it back up. It's pretty simple. There's no monthly fee, unlike a lot of other brands that charge you that fee. You can have your recordings locally and never have to pay for storage. Uh, Eufy is also on standby for you 24-7, and you can get a worry-free experience with an 18-month warranty, all backed by our professional customer service team. Contact them anytime by telephone, email, or even live chat, which is awfully, awfully convenient. And here's the thing. There's just so much out there in the world these days. Wouldn't it be nice to know maybe who visited your door when you're out or perhaps have the security of knowing that you've got video surveillance anytime somebody comes to your door? We absolutely can. Make sure that you look for Eufy Video Lock. That's visit E-U-F-Y official.com slash video lock to see how you can gain complete troll of your door. All right, Bulldog fans, let's go ahead and admit it. Mississippi State folks and boots are awful fond of one another. Our friends at Tecovis are back to get you ready for this festival and concert season. You know it's going to be all about boots, and Tecovis is your stop for festival style. Tecovis has seasonal and limited edition offerings this spring, including men's and women's boots, apparel, hats, bags, and so much more. All Tecovis boots are made by hand in a time-honored tradition with timeless styles that are always on trend. And Tecovis has first wear comfort with little to no break-in period. It's hard to find that level of comfort paired with this level of style. Plus, their direct-to-consumer pricing keeps value on your feet and money in your pocket. Stop by your local Tacova store, have a complimentary drink or two, and shop new styles. The smell of fresh leather and a friendly staff are always at your service. Many stores even have leather custom branding to make your boots truly personalized. And with regular live music and events coming up, there's no in-store experience quite like theirs. If you can't make it into a store, just visit Tacovas. that's T-E-C-O-V-A-S dot com. They offer free shipping on all boots as well as free returns and exchanges and ship right to your door. Go to tecovis.com today and find your new favorite pair of boots. ...of a lifetime as your wedding song, and maybe if you didn't, your parents weren't okay with that, you, you had that as your song when you were dating in the early 90s. And uh, yeah, for me, uh, that was a great one, but uh, when I look into your eyes is one that was very popular off the Hold Your Fire album uh, when Dana and I first started dating. And so... Uh, it's a very, very tough thing. And so for all of you to love Firehouse, uh, it's a sad day. And so I encourage you to maybe jam some Firehouse. Let's get Firehouse uh, rolling on iTunes and uh, keep that music alive. I don't, I don't know that anybody wrote better power ballads in the 80s and early 90s than Firehouse. And C.J. Snare, an incredible guy. And uh, you know, I, I met him briefly at a show one time. It's not like we were friends or anything, but we did have some mutual friends and uh, one of the things I think that it's cool that I want to share with you guys, of course, we, we didn't do it, but um, after we did Rock Vegas and uh, Lillian came and played, I had uh, multiple booking agents reached out to me about booking shows in Starkville. And the booking agent from Firehouse hit me up about a week after Rock Vegas and said that Firehouse wanted to play Rock Vegas 2023. And uh, our yeah, or 22, whatever year. What it all, The years all run together. I guess it was 23. That Firehouse wanted to do it. And um, it was going to cost us a pretty penny. And, uh, of course, you know, John Cohen left to go to Auburn. And, you know, we had new relationships. And I just couldn't pull it all together. But it makes me both proud and sad 
that Firehouse wanted to come to Starkville and play Rock Vegas. And the booking agent sent the email and said, hey, you know, we have friends in Lillian X, and they tell me they were treated so incredibly well there, and uh, we're looking for a place to play. We do play Philadelphia, Mississippi every now and again, but we're always looking for more opportunities to come to the South. And uh, it means a lot to me that the guys in Firehouse wanted to come to Starkville and play, and unfortunately we were able to pull that together. But um, it's a, I'm sad about this. I really am. It's not just one of those things you look at and say, well, it's a celebrity death. And, but um, C.J. Snare sang so much of the soundtrack of uh, mine and Dana's early relationship. In fact, when we had our renewal service, uh, I did a video. And I'll probably find that and post it again. Um, that I, I posted of us and all of our children, you know, back before I had long hair, you know, and... Uh, I did that, and her mom was so impressed with it that after the ceremony was over, she said, can I watch the video again? And it was set to Firehouse's I Live My Life For You. Uh, but yeah, I, I get emotional thinking about all that stuff because there are so many great songs that, uh, that those guys have, uh, have produced over the years, and so many people don't know anything other than the hits. And so I encourage you, uh, jam some Firehouse, and uh, man, rest in peace, CJ and... Uh, much prayers and thoughts to everybody that loved him. All right, next segment of the show brought to you by Campus Bookmart, a Stark Billion institution. Man, I love Campus Bookmart. I love going in there because I know that I'm going to find something that I want to buy. You know, it's like I see all that Mississippi State merchandise and I think, man, if some is good, more is better, right? That's exactly how it is. You go in there and you think, man, I want to get this, I want to get that. So many great things to choose from, whether it be, you know, to, to you know, restock the wardrobe. Get some fresh threads. Man, summertime's coming up. Vacation's going to be here. Mom, I'm going to tell you. Nothing better than having Mississippi State Day when you're out at Disney. Just have everybody rocked out in MSU gear. It's great. Rep the brand wherever you go. Maybe you're building a fan cave. I don't know. Maybe you got a new rig and you want to put a Mississippi State license plate holder on there. Maybe you've got a graduate coming up. And you want, maybe that's a gift. Maybe it's a good grandparent or aunt and uncle gift. You buy that diploma frame from Campus Book Mart for your Mississippi State graduate. That is a great thing. I've done that for both of my girls. Had to buy two for one of them. How about that? But everything that you need to demonstrate your Bulldog fandom is available at Campus Book Mart. If you can't make it to town, visit them on the World Wide Web at campusbookmart.net. And by being a loyal Boneyard listener, we'll give you a phrase that pays. Yeah, promo code BSR, which stands for Beautiful Steve Robertson. That gets you free shipping on all orders over 75 bucks. Any order less than 75 bones, absolutely incomplete. Okay, we might go long today because I have so much to say. So I want to address, first of all, what happened, what happened in the aftermath, and what needs to happen now, okay? So as you guys know, the uh, Jeff Head, who was the, the crew chief on our officiating crew, and uh, Jeff's a guy who strikes on, is, uh, leaves a lot to be desired at times. But this guy's been around a long time, has a great reputation for doing things with integrity. You heard Chris Simonis speak about that both Saturday and Sunday night, uh, about the quality of the crew, which is a good move anyway. I mean, number one, you, you, you don't want people that are not involved in the decision-making process to be unfairly maligned. So I thought it was big of Chris to come out and say that. The decision was made at the control center in Birmingham. Now, some of the SEC executives were at the Final Four watching Alabama lose. Some of the SEC executives were at the Final Four watching South Carolina women win an NFL championship. And then apparently whoever was left was making decisions in the control center. And this is one of my biggest problems with every bit of this, and I've said this countless times. And maybe this will lead to the impetus for change. Guys, we can no longer protect these people with the cloak of anonymity and the the shroud of secrecy. Here's the thing. If I make a mistake, right? I own jeanspage.com. I'm the contract holder with 247 Sports. If I go out there and do something that is detrimental to the brand of 247 Sports or CBS Interactive, I will be held accountable. Everything that I write has my name on it. If I go out there and write something and accuse somebody of something, 
and it's un- improper, and I do it with malicious intent, I could be uh, sued for libel or defamation. So I am accountable for what I do. You are accountable for what you do. I don't care if you work at a warehouse or you work on Wall Street. If you go out there and do something improper, you are held accountable. And here's the problem that I have with how the SEC does things. And I, and I have some people tell me, well, Steve, you don't understand. I, I don't care if you get your fee ones hurt. I hope you get a bunch of letters and emails. I hope you do. And I understand that some people in the league are very embarrassed about what happened. And they should be. They absolutely should be. But my rub with all this is that we expect an 18-year-old, 19-year-old kid to walk out there and face the media after they drop a pass or throw an interception or miss a big shot or strike out on national television. We expect them to go in there and answer questions when their heart has been ripped out. And all of a sudden, they go log on their social media accounts and you got all these people ripping them left and right. And you say, you know what, Steve, that's life and times on the big stage. And I get that. I do. I understand it. I don't always like it, but I understand it. If a coach goes out on a limb and criticizes officiating and the fact that anybody thinks they're beyond reproach is one of the most arrogant and narcissistic things that I've ever seen in my life. So a coach can't go out there and criticize an official. I, I brought this up on Bo Bound Show earlier. Lane Kiffin, head coach at Ole Miss. And I complained about this on Twitter when it happened. There was an incident, and Lane Kiffin criticized officials, and he was fined. And the SEC office fires off a statement. Lane Kiffin fired for criticizing and officiating. There was an issue, and they said, well, you know, the we're going to handle the other matter internally. Why is Lane Kiffin treated one way and the official treated another? Why is that withheld from public consumption? It makes no sense to me. And my honest belief is, is I think a lot of these problems would be cleared up if there was some public scrutiny for this. I want everybody to be accountable. I I believe in a meritocracy, right? And I want everybody to get credit for what they do. You cannot be a nameless, faceless individual and make decisions like this that lead to multiple suspensions on both teams and basically just disallow what the crew wanted to do here. The crew didn't deem the situation to be worthy of everybody getting ejected. That was all the control center. And we ended up having a left fielder who was the last out of the ball game, who had thrown 100 pitches the night before. You tell me that's in the interest of of student-athlete safety? You kidding me? We had no choice. And what's so incredibly ridiculous and insane about all this is they say, well, because here's what the rule reads, right? Like if there's a fight or dust-up or something, you're not supposed to relieve your position. Okay, I get that. Guys, it's the third out of the inning. By nature, you relieve your position because you've got to go to the dugout and get a bat go hit. And so what's funny is everybody on the field had for Mississippi State had the same behavior, with the exception of Johnny Long. Hunter Hines comes down there and immediately grabs Johnny Long to get him away from it. He's being a leader, he's being a peacemaker, and he gets suspended. Gets ejected from the ball game and suspended. Amani Larry, who made the throw home, just kind of wandering away there, ejected and suspended. Logan Kohler, who saw his childhood friend involved with the dust up of Johnny Long, goes over to check on his friend and to ensure the situation doesn't escalate. He's patting him on the back as they're walking away. Not only was he ejected and suspended, his suspension was upheld. But then Connor Hysack and Dave Marchand are able to play. So how does that logic apply? It doesn't. And we're going to sit here and trot this stupid hashtag out, oh, it just means more. If it means more, then give me more accountability. Give me more transparency. Give me more clarity. 
Chris Lamonis, the head baseball coach at Mississippi State, Wes Johnson, the coach of Georgia, former Mississippi State assistant coach, they don't even know who made the decision. Not only do they keep it from us, they keep it from them. That's the thing, too. You don't like the appearance of impropriety? Then remove the shroud of secrecy. It's absolutely ludicrous. And we shouldn't stand for it. Now, right now, I, I guarantee you there's a lot of people in Birmingham that are saying, well, you know, State won the game and won the series. Let's just all move on. No, 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 because it happens too often. Now, we just saw the most embarrassing and egregious example of it. Do you remember when we went over there and played at Alabama under Joe Moorhead? I guess it was in 2018, and they fumble in the first possession, and Gary Green recovers a fumble. We don't even get the courtesy of a review. And, of course, they come back later and say, well, this nameless, faceless person tried to stop the game. They couldn't get the game stopped. That's absolute malarkey, man. You mean to tell me that the SEC office can't get a game stopped when they see a problem? They didn't want to stop it. That's the same game, too, when Dedrick Thomas was flagged for a phantom block in the back penalty. And to give the lead credit, Jeff Batts was suspended. And I don't think he's officiated an SEC game since then. Maybe he has. I haven't kept up in recent years. So we did get that. Of course, that takes a touchdown off the board. And Alabama was a great team that year. They were. And, you know, we might have gone over there and won that game. What happens if we get that fumble recovery early in the ball game? What happens if we do get that touchdown with Colin Hill? Maybe it's a different game. We had one of the best defenses in the country that year. And so there's all these issues that have popped up. And let's go back to the Egg Bowl a few years ago. When the SEC Control Center, remember this? We had the fight with A.J. Brown and Jonathan Abram. Remember, do you remember this? And A.J. Moore from Ole Miss, who had been out for the year, was dressed for senior day, is ejected from the game because the SEC Control Center can't identify the players correctly by number on video. It's a joke, man. It's a joke. And let's be honest about this. A.J. Brown and Jonathan Abrams should have both been ejected. They both should have been. Makes no sense at all. You couldn't even get the numbers right. It's a clown show, bro. The whole thing. Every bit of it. Now, Greg Sankey may have handled that behind the scenes, and maybe so. But what does message does that send to the next guy? right? I can screw up and change an outcome of a ball game and the participants in the ball game, and these people will be publicly scorned and scrutinized. The fact that we're still talking about this six years later says a lot. Those people are held up to public ridicule, but the person responsible for ensuring that we have a level playing field and enforcing your rules gets to act in anonymity. It's wrong. It's absolutely wrong. There should be blood in the streets, man. And I listen, I don't know Greg Sankey's business. I think Greg Sankey is a great leader for the Southeastern Conference. But this whole officiating thing, that's a burr in the saddle, man. That's a bad look for our conference. And I remember when all that stuff happened before, I had a source that told me when uh, Greg Sankey got back to the SEC office, that Steve Shaw was waiting there for him. And the first thing Greg said is, Steve, what's up? He goes, well, I need to talk to you. We had a problem with a game. And Greg says, please tell me it was in Alabama. And, of course, it was. I'm not sitting here alleging malfeasance. I'm just alleging complete incompetence. And I think rather than cover for these people, hold them accountable. I think everybody involved in this process should know everybody involved in this process. And that was one of the frustrations that Chris Simonis aired on Saturday. He goes, we don't even know who made the decision. I want to know who made the decision. The SEC has to do better. Has to. You want people to continue to support the conference? You want people to continue to buy merchandise and buy season tickets? You have an obligation to your shareholders and your success to tell them what's happening with their team. You have an obligation. And the SEC is trying to skirt behind that because they make the rules. 
And it's wrong. Everybody should be held accountable. Everybody. And I don't know what happened with Morris Hodges. I don't know what they told him. I know he didn't officiate a game last the two weekends ago. He was back in Baton Rouge last weekend, so maybe it was a one-weekend suspension. I don't know. I don't know that. He may have asked off for Easter. Maybe they didn't do anything. I don't believe that. I was told shortly after the incident happened that he wouldn't be officiating the next weekend. But why isn't that made public? And it's not like it's unprecedented within the league. We've had some situations in the past where – you know, I think it was Arkansas that got uh, got beat on a bad call. They suspended the whole crew and made it public. So it's not like it's without precedent for the league to make these statements. I just understand. I want to know why they're so reluctant to do it. You obviously screwed up, and you changed the outcome of a baseball game. Not to mention, to mention Chris Simonis coaching for his job this year. That win may be the difference in making it or not. That game may be the difference in hosting or not. You know, Wes Johnson, brand new coach over there. They're trying to make the tournament. They're trying to get a turnaround out there. They got a quality club. Both teams deserve to have some measure of accountability. And the fact that the coaches don't even know the name of the person making the decision, what a joke, man. It's a joke. And apparently Zach Selman agrees with me. Because at 1 in the morning, after that debacle, Zach Selman and I'm told this by an impeccable source, your athletic director, went to the baseball office and told them, hey, we're playing our kids tomorrow, with the exception of Johnny Long. We're going to play our 27-man roster minus Johnny, and uh, we'll deal with the league however we have to. We're not st- this is not going to stand. And I understand that Chris Lamonis and Zach Selman had multiple conversations late into the night, had to get up early and deal with it again. And uh, I'm very proud of Zach Selman for standing up for our our student athletes and for our program and for our coaches. And uh, I was told, too, when Lamontis came in there on Saturday night uh, for the press conference, and he'd already been told, Chris, say what you need to say. Say what you need to say. Everybody knows that you're angry. Say what you need to say. I think it's huge to see the athletic department stand behind our coaches and our student athletes when we have been improperly aggrieved here. It's terrible. And then, of course, word comes Sunday morning, hey, we're playing a roster. We're going to play our roster. And I thought, I thought then let's go to war. Let's do it. Let's hold the SEC accountable for their actions. You know, they're so big about holding everybody else accountable and, and issuing statements and making everybody else look stupid and childish and uh, putting them up there for public ridicule, except for their own people. Those people work for the schools, not the other way around. That's one of the problems that we have right now. The league should be accountable to the schools, not the schools be accountable to the league. Kind of like that whole thing, you know, in V for Vendetta. You know, the government should be afraid of their people. People shouldn't be afraid of their governments. That's how I see this thing, too. The whole thing's a world of power. A lot of people making a lot of money off these SEC schools, and all of a sudden there's no accountability. I think the league presidents have to demand a change. Everybody. But Zach Selman held their feet to the fire. Now, to be fair, I was told once the high-level executives of the SEC found out what happened, they were appalled at what happened. And obviously they were going to go along with whatever Mississippi State wanted and, uh, and Georgia, for that matter, too. Georgia's a victim in this thing, too. You know, you know Georgia didn't cause the issue. The SEC Control Center did. Uh, so I, I share that with you because it's important to understand the adults in the room got together and we got through Sunday. But that can't be enough. We can't just – now, Chris Lamonis has got to move on. Okay, Chris has got to go coach the season. But Zach Selman and the leadership around this conference – They've got to get together and ensure that something like this never happens again, ever. Not just to us, but to anybody in this league. It is an embarrassment. It is an absolute dereliction of duty that somebody can just sit back there and, uh, and basically impact not just one game, but potentially two, and change the trajectory of our season. It makes no sense to me. And then the coaches involved don't know their names? Give me a break. 
Well, let's talk about this triumphant game on Sunday. And again, we may go a little bit longer today. And that's okay. You can get it in two parts if you need to. But I needed to say that. And again, the leadership at Mississippi State cannot let this stand. You cannot just say, okay, we won the series. All's well that ends well. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And I can promise you there's support around the league because nobody wants it to happen to them. All right, so we get to the Sunday game, and, uh, you know, we got out there with Nate, and uh, Nate comes out, goes eight pitches, and that's the thing I thought about, man. We get the emotional lift with Nate going out there. Man, it's going to be dogs by 50. Nate goes eight pitches, has to come out. I'm told that he just didn't feel right. It's not a recurrence. He's just not quite right. And I appreciate Nate trying to come to his teammates' aid in our time of need. I really do. That kid is hard. He is. But, um, yeah, we give up a single to Goldstein, and then Condon lines out at center field. And there's a wild pitch, and then uh, we bring in Sierra. And uh, I, I agree with Chris. I, don't, I think that kid, in an injury situation, let him whoop in, uh, in the bullpen. Let them go to their normal procedure. That's a rule that needs to be changed. And then Sierra walks Collins, and Alford flies out to right, and then Phelps lines out. And so good for Sierra. I mean, you come in there – the fire is burning, and you add to it by walking it. And, you know, but you're able to get out of it without surrendering to run. That's a win for Mississippi State. Bottom of first day goes one, two, three. Larry flies out to left. Marshawn flies out to left. And then Jordan strikes out swinging. Lengthy at bat there. Struck out on a full count. Sierra back out for the second. He gets Branch swinging. Gets Chad with a ground out to short, who uh, should have been suspended himself. He was the one, of course, acting like a Benny Rooster out there that hit the uh, home run in the ninth of the Saturday game, uh, and yet he's not suspended. Uh, Gonzalez and singles through the left side. Morello flies out to center field. Of course, uh, we, we mentioned Gonzalez. What's interesting, too, and this is, again, we won the game, right? But, uh, you know, Henry Hunter and Gonzalez were both on the suspended list. And they're like, well, one of those guys has got to play. Guys, Collins catches too. If they could have made it work, I didn't like it. That's why it was so much more rewarding to win the game. I, I, I didn't like the way that was handled. I think at that point they just wanted to get through with the path of least resistance without causing any more issues with the teams. I think that's, that's what I believe. Morello flies out to center field. And um, thankfully, Morello didn't do much on Sunday. He had a good weekend against us. Uh, bottom of second, Hines flies out, pops out to the shortstop in short left. Uh, Isaac then grounds out the third. Chance singles through the left side. So we got a little something going here. And then McKenzie hits a sinking liner to right. The, the fielder actually fell down. Thought it was going to get by him for a second. But uh, it's good to see Jackson have a chance to barrel one up, hit that ball really hard. That was on an 0-2 count, too. And so runners are first and second, and Chester strikes out swinging. And, uh, again, it's a two-out situation here. But two two-out two, two hits, we couldn't get the third. that could have played the run there. All right, top of the third, and this is when the wheels kind of came off for Evan. Goldstein strikes out swinging, and then Condon singles through the left side, and this is where I thought things changed. Collins gets down 1-2 in the count. We end up walking him. If we're able to retire Collins here, I'm not saying even roll up a double play here, but if you're able to retire Collins, it's probably a different inning. He walks. Sanders runs at first and second. A ground ball gets us out of it, but instead Slade offered singles through the right side. Run scores, one nothing. And then we continue to kind of add to our own misery. Phelps is hit by the pitch. And then Branch hits a home run, the grand slam. And it's 5 nothing. And again, you go back. There's so many situations here. Where, you know, every pitch matters in baseball. Every pitch matters. And we'll get more on that a little bit later in the show. But now it's 5 nothing, And most people thought, well, here it is. And you got to think, to the emotional fragility of this team. At this point, after all they'd gone through Saturday night, they feel like a game was ripped away from them. Nate comes out, can't go, and now we're down 5 nothing. We absolutely, absolutely could have just folded up shop and said it's not our day. But your Bulldogs would not be denied. And Sierra bounces back after the Grand Slam, gets Chadwick to strike out looking, and Gonzalez to fly out to left center. All right, bottom of third, again, you know, State could have just said, you know what, guys, let's go ahead and pack up the bats. You know, let's just get ready for Ole Miss. 
Uh, Joe Powell grounds out to the pitcher. Larry's hit by the pitch. Again, It's, it's he's like a magnet for it. It's crazy. Then Mershon is hit by the pitch, and that's when you realize, you know, this Georgia – Pitcher's beginning to fade a little bit. And if you notice, too, like he's only been working about four innings a game. And then Jordan comes through and singles up the middle. And then Condon overruns it, which allows the second run to score. Now it's 5-2, and the crowd is rocking. You're thinking, you know what, hey, it's only bottom of third. We're just down three. They go ahead and pull uh, Maragda, bring in Colton Smith, who's really good. He gets Hines to uh, strike out swinging. And then Hyzak hits that ball to right, and uh, it's crazy how this thing works. Like, the game always finds you. And, uh, you know, Phelps decides to kind of bury Bonds it out there. It's a nonchalant thing. And, man, the wind is just rocking out there. And he just tries to nonchalant that thing, and he drops it. And then our student section and those in right field let him hear about it. A run scores there, and then Chance comes up behind him and singles through the left side to drive in another run. Now it's 5-4. With two errors on the outfield for Georgia in the inning. And then McKenzie strikes out swinging. But it's 5 4 ball game, and it's now a ball game again. We bring in Brooks Auger. I thought Brooks was really good. He, he, he kind of tapped out late. You know, Brooks is usually a one to two inning guy, but Brooks went out there and competed. I guess Marilla to ground out to short. Goldstein singles to the right side. Condon flies out the right, and Collins strikes out swinging. Which we're back in the dugout. You got a chance to pull even. Chester doubles down the right field line. And again, these are the things that get infuriating over time. The leadoff double, you have to find a way to get this run home, especially in a game like this. Powell strikes out swinging. We don't get the bunt down. We got we, You have to get the bunt down there and get that guy to second base, give top of the order a chance to, to get him in. Well, we don't. We strike out swinging there. And then uh, Amani Larry's hit by the pitch again, like 13 times now. It's crazy. So now you got runners at first and second with two, three, and four coming up. Got to get a base hit. Marshawn grounds into a double play here. That ends the inning. And, again, it would have been easy to pout and say, you know what, it's just not our day. But we're just a one-run ball game, right? All right, top of fifth, Alford strikes out swinging again. Phelps singles to the shortstop. Really nice play here from Marshawn. We just we couldn't get it done. Uh, Branch flies out to left, and Chadwick flies out down the uh, left field line. That ball carried a long way. It really surprised me how far that, far that ball carried. It's now 5-4 in the bottom of five, and uh, we've got 3-4-5 coming up. DJ strikes out swinging. Hines strikes out swinging, and that's a thing, too. When you get these three guys together in one inning, at some point somebody's going to get you, and, and Connor Heisig does. Playing electric baseball for Mississippi State. He homers down the left field line to tie the game, and then Chance uh, fouls out outside of ground. Really nice play here, too. That ball was fouled into the Georgia bullpen. Uh, first baseman runs over there and kind of makes an overhand catch there. Oh, you're kind of running away from the diamond. Really nice play. You, we want to recognize good baseball when there's good baseball played, even if it's not by us. But that was a really nice play. All right, top of six, top all game. Gonzalez flies out to left, and Murillo gets on in a throw in there here. This is where we're talking about. This is the thing about every pitch matters. Blake, excuse me, Blake. Brooks Auger had thrown strike three. Period. Period. He had thrown strike three. He has a K looking. Does not get the call. The very next pitch, he rolls up a ground ball, goes in a Chester, and Nate throws it in the dirt. And Rella reaches on the air. It's a tough luck deal being an SEC pitcher. You get squeezed by a home plate umpire, and then you do get the ground ball, and next thing you know, you've got you've got nothing out of it. Now, matter of fact, you've got a runner. It's tough luck in this league at times. Goldstein and single to the right side. It's now a first and third situation. You feel like, okay, they're going to score. We get Condon to strike out swinging. And then Colin singles to center field, pushes in that run. A guy that should never have been on base. You know, people always say, that's on you, Blue. Not that Blue cares. That's on Blue, and that's on Nate Chester. And he will own that, as all baseball players will. That run should not have even been on base, much less scored. And then Slade Alford flies out to right field. I almost feel like every time I mention Slade, it's like a punchline. I don't mean it to be. But um, bottom of six, we're trailing again. And, uh, again, State answers. Good teams answer. And we did. Uh, McKenzie strikes out swinging. And then Chester works it for a walk. Lengthy at bat there, too. And then Joe Powell pulls it inside the bag at third for a double. Chester comes all the way around to score uh, from first. 
and uh, play at the plate there, and um, he was in. But uh, that was a lot closer than I expected to be. I can't believe they let that ball get as far wrapped up in the corner as they did. It was a good relay, but uh, Chester's in. Good effort for Chester to kind of atone from their earlier mistake. All right, they bring in Radke for uh, Colton Smith here, and he immediately walks Amani Larry. And they're like, no, that's it. He's done. They bring in Gillespie now, and he gets Mershon to strike out swinging. But then DJ comes through and singles through and uh, scores the uh, go-ahead run. Drives in a go-ahead run. Hines and grounds out to the pitcher. But State, again, has answered. And so two runs in the inning, and it's uh, 7-6. Bulldogs. So we're all the way back. And you feel like, hey, this is all for us. It's ours for the taking. That's how it felt. But give Georgia some credit. They just didn't go quietly. But here we are again. Trey Phelps. This time, we get a ground ball to third, and Chester, determined not to throw it low, throws it high. And he reaches. And then Branch singles. Phelps goes to second. And then Chadwick doubles in the right center. Both run score. And so, again, back-to-back innings, we have an error on the infield, and both guys score. And the tight ball game can't do that. Now, they had some errors, too, right? That's part of baseball. But that's how it works. So we bring in Tower Davis here. And uh, tough luck for Auger because, you know, those runs are charged to him. But, um, you know, a couple of them aren't earned. But the reality of it is, is Brooks wants to win, right? It's not about his statistics. He goes out there and does his job. The guys around him, including the home plate umpires, got to do theirs. Tyler Davis comes in, ends up being the last Bulldog pitcher of the day. He gets Gonzalez to pop up to first. Morello flies out to right. And then Goldstein fouls out to third. Really good calming effect there, but we needed to find a way to get even. Had our chances in the seventh. High Zach walks, leadoff walk, and then Chance walks. And so here we are, again, this self-inflicted error here, right? Runners at first and second. You're like, hey, we're going we're gonna to pinch hit Aaron Downs for Jackson McKenzie. Aaron can get the bunt down. In the middle of that at bat, Georgia loses focus, and Connor Hyzak still third. And Bryce Chance probably should have been going on the plate, too. And I really felt like, hey, we needed to um, – even if he didn't go then, you're, you're running later because Gonzalez could throw him out. With a runner at third, you're not even going to get a competitive throw. I thought that was a failure by the staff right there. I was kind of calling it for what it is. Maybe they saw – maybe maybe Bryce didn't feel 100%. I don't know. But uh, we got to take that bag at second. So they make all these pitching changes, and then uh, they walk downs, which forces Chance to second. And for some reason, Hyzak thought the bases were loaded, and he's going to try it home. This is on Cheeseboro and the kid, right? It's on both. And um, you would think a coach shouldn't have to tell a kid. But here's the reality. I say kid, he's a young man. But how many times do you hear it? Like every time that there's a runner on, like, hey, you got two down, you got a runner here, force here, we're going, you know, ground ball, see it. See it through, tag. You know, there's there's so many instructions you give, but everybody shares in the blame here. But the bottom line is Connor Heisack is responsible for himself. He's played a lot of baseball. He'll tell you it was his fault. He gets picked off third. So then you you basically have gained nothing from this. You know, you were you were first and second with nobody out. And you had a chance to get runners to second, third, in scoring position with one out, and now you're one out and nobody has moved essentially because we gift them an out right here. Absolute brain fart. And it happened twice. Happened with Rashawn and with the – and Isaac. But uh, Chester then walks, which only aggravates it worse, right? So now bases are loaded, two outs. Powell strikes out swinging, and Larry pops up to the shortstop. Bases loaded situation here. And again, the Benicia say, you know what? It's just not our day. We needed somebody – we needed Joe Powell to just give us a ball and fair play here. You know, give me a fly ball to right, left – Something. Get the run home. Didn't Needed to do a job. We didn't get it done. Top of eight. Davis still on the hill. Condon strikes out looking. Big, big strike out there. Collins singles to right. Then Alford strikes out swinging. And then Phelps is hit by the pitch. And then we are able to get out of it. And it kind of felt right then. I turned to Mike Nemeth and I said, hey, we've got to win it right here. We've got to take the lead here. I don't want to go in the ninth. We need, we need to find a way to get even or at least uh, at least get even. We hope to get the lead here. And we do. Mershon grounds out the second, and then DJ walks, and then Hunter Hines comes up with a really big hit in the ball game. Uh, singles to right field. Jordan loses the shoe going to second, so he can't take third. 
And then Hyzak hits that ball back up to middle. Uh, they charged the error on uh, Swade Alford. It was a tough play, but uh, I can see, uh, you know, there's some things I can say I'm not going to. But uh, the, the, the game is tied, and then Bryce Chance comes up and does a job. Elevates one to right field. We tag and score. And then down strikes out looking. And so it's 9 8 now. As we go to the ninth, and TD was not going to be denied here. You get a ground, and it's so great. You're facing seven, eight, nine. It couldn't have set up any better. Chadwick, the guy that hit the home run in the ninth on Saturday, is the first out of the ninth on Sunday. Gonzalez, who should have, who was suspended and shouldn't have played, grounds out the first, and then Morello strikes out swinging on three pitches uh, to end the ball game. Uh, so really, really, really good effort there uh, from Tyler Davis. And uh, we're going to take a quick look at some other things and get out of here. We'll only be over a few minutes, I promise. But, um, yeah, I'm just so proud of our team and our coaches. Everybody's kind of hanging together here. But, um, yeah, Amani Larry goes 0 for 2. Mershon 0 for 4 in the ballgame. Uh, Dakota Jordan 2 for 4, a couple runs scored in an RBI. Hunter Hines goes 1 for 5, uh, does score a run. Connor Hyzak 1 for 4 with an RBI, two runs scored. Bryce Chance uh, 2 for 3, two RBI for him. Jackson McKenzie goes 1 for 3. Aaron Downs 0 for 1. Uh, as the pinch hitter, Nate Chester, one for two, also had a couple of walks. We reached his base, reached his base three times in the ballgame. Uh, Joe Powell, one for four. And uh, one was pretty big, to say the least. Uh, pitching numbers here, Nate Dahm, of course, just goes one-third of an inning. Evan Sierra, 2.2 innings, four hits, five runs, two Ks, excuse me, three Ks, two walks. Uh, Brooks Auger goes three, allows six hits. And... Uh, Again, I think we stretched him a little bit too. Probably Brooks probably really good at two endings there, but uh, six hits, three runs, only one of them earned. Tyler Davis goes three innings pitch, allows one hit, three strikeouts, no walks, on just uh, 40 pitches. Credited with his third win. So Bulldogs win the series, and uh, we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit about um, in our final segment of the show about you know what that means. All right, final segment of the show brought to you by the Stark Vegas Clubhouse. Just Google Stark Vegas Clubhouse. You want to bring a large group to Starkville, the best place to stay is the Stark Vegas Clubhouse. No matter if it's a work group, a friend group, a family group, maybe it's a couple's weekend, maybe everybody just wants to get together and reminisce and reconnect and maybe do that around Mississippi State, maybe attend some sporting events, or maybe you've got a crew that's working in the Golden Triangle. It's so much more affordable to have everybody under one roof just makes perfect sense. You know, so if you're looking to to plan an event, Stark Vegas Clubhouse can help. You know, you've got some booking options. You can book through VRBO. You can book through Airbnb. However, if you book through the Evolve website, use promo code BSR10, get you 10% off your stay. Again, just five minutes away from the Mississippi State campus. Five bedrooms, two bad. That tremendous back porch area. You're going to fall in love with that. The fire pit area. Full-service kitchen, you can stock that refrigerator and cook all weekend. Rather than just go out and, you know, spend a bunch of money, you get the wet bar there. You can stay in, right? You can just say, you know what, hey, we're going to go up here, we're going to cook, we're going to hang out. We're just going to enjoy being together. Stark Vegas Clubhouse makes that possible. Also owned and operated by Mississippi State people, as you would imagine. All right, so uh, the weekend results, we'll be quick about this. Arkansas sweeps Ole Miss. We expected that to happen. Uh, Vanderbilt takes uh, two from LSU and Alex Box. Kind of a rare thing for a road team to win a series. But what's happened is uh, you're starting to see some teams aren't quite as good as we expected. But Vanderbilt, kind of a surprising result there. They go in there and they take two or three from LSU. You say surprising, Steve. Uh, I just really thought LSU would be able to, uh, to defend Alex Box. They weren't able to do so. Alabama swept by Kentucky. What can you say about the Wildcats? We keep expecting them to uh, to stumble, but they haven't. Still tied for first in the SEC. Texas A&M goes to South Carolina. Takes two out of three. South Carolina no longer ranked in top 25. Georgia, of course, comes to Mississippi State. Loses two out of three. Tennessee takes two of three at Auburn. Things just aren't getting any better for Auburn. The most surprising result, though, is Florida goes on the road and gets swept by Missouri. I'm absolutely shocked that that happened. I, I am shocked. Not that I think Florida's elite. I just didn't think Missouri was going to be able to do that. And it's so weird to have to go play at Missouri. It's a, it's a different environment. It's almost like playing back in high school in many respects. It's not a big stadium, not big crowds. But um, nuts for Florida. And it really gave everybody an opportunity to not rank them. 
right? All right, so let's take a look at the standings now. Rather significant uh, movement in some respects. In the West, Arkansas still leads the league and the West with 11-1 record. Texas A&M is second at 8-4. Your Bulldogs, the Diamond Dogs, now have the fourth best record in the Southeastern Conference. They're third in the SEC West at 6-6. Six and six. Alabama's 4-8. and eight. Told you guys before, I think Alabama's fool's gold. I, I really think we can get those guys. LSU now 3-9. and nine. Tied with Ole Miss for fifth, 3-9. and nine. Ole Miss has been swept in back-to-back weekends. We hope to make it three. And then Auburn now 2-10. and 10. And now Auburn, the worst record in the Southeastern Conference in league play by two games. And if you're Auburn, it's time to panic. Ten losses already? Ten. You, you can kind of do the math from there, right? You're 12 games in. You got 18 to play. It's nuts, man. It's nuts. I can't believe Auburn's this bad. On the eastern side of things, Nick Mangion, probably right now I would say maybe your SEC coach of the year. I mean, you expected Arkansas to be great. I mean, your preseason number one. But Kentucky 11-1 after all they lost last year. Vanderbilt now 8-4 and four after the weekend series. Uh, they're second in the east. Tennessee 7-5, their third. Florida now fourth at 6-6, six and six, tied with South Carolina. I would venture to say, and I know what the, 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 the record books suggest, Mississippi State is better than Florida and South Carolina. We won't get a chance to prove it against South Carolina unless we see them in Hoover. Georgia now down to sixth in the east. They're five and seven. And then Missouri now again seventh in the east, but four and eight. And uh, probably sending a bit of a uh, warning to everybody else that, hey, we're not just going to be here for your, uh, for your enjoyment. And so, wild weekend in the Southeastern Conference. I don't know that anything is wilder than happened here. But uh, let's take a quick look ahead here uh, as we get ready to look at the uh, SEC baseball schedule. And again, not only is the SEC not running a good website, they're not running a good control center either. Uh, Mississippi State, of course, our next ball game is going to be Tuesday night at home against uh, UAB. Need you to turn out for that one if you can. We'd love to see you. It's always good to see you for midweek baseball. Doesn't always work out that way. But uh, nevertheless, let's take a quick look here. And again, this website is so, so, so user unfriendly. If that's not a term, we'll make it one. All right. Uh, so Georgia will host Kennesaw State on Tuesday. Kennesaw State has kind of been uh, a spoiler in many respects. It's a good mid-major program. Alabama A&M will visit Tennessee. Uh, Southeast Illinois University at Edwardsville will take on Missouri. South Carolina is at North Carolina on Tuesday game. That may be fun to watch. San Jose State's at Arkansas. Florida and Florida State. Florida State has already beaten Florida twice this year. Of course, UAB is here. South Alabama will go to Alabama. Middle Tennessee is at Vandy. UTSA is at Texas A&M. Alabama State's at Auburn. Kentucky's going to make the trip to Sanford. How about that? Sanford getting some SEC schools in there. Uh, Murray State's at Ole Miss and McNeese State's at LSU. That's all your Tuesday games. We'll recap some of that on Wednesday. Uh, but kind of looking ahead to the weekend, it's a very busy week in the conference. There's a lot of people playing a couple of midweek games. So, uh, you know, Arkansas is uh, one of the – I guess the only one. My apologies. Uh, Missouri and Georgia will get together on Thursday. And that'll be interesting. I just don't know if Missouri has the pitching. To, to face Georgia's lineup at Foley Field, it's going to be rough. Uh, Kentucky at Auburn. Nick Mangione, Butch Thompson, John Cohen can all get together. Uh, those two programs appear to be heading in two different directions. Those two series begin on Thursday. And, again, we'll, uh, we'll look ahead to that on the Wednesday show. But uh, South Carolina's at Florida. Arkansas's at Alabama. Uh, Vanderbilt's at A&M. Of course, State's at Ole Miss. LSU's at Tennessee. Man, LSU could really dig themselves into a hole they can't dig out of uh, this weekend. Could be a tough one. And uh, eager to see that Vandy A&M series. And, uh, you know, you start looking at the standings, you start thinking, you know, who can help us? You know, we need some, fo- we need some folks to clear the traffic for us, but the most important thing is we got to keep winning. we got to keep winning. And my hope is, is that our fans can kind of get behind 
our staff, and our administration. Guys, we are all shareholders in Mississippi State sports. We are all shareholders in Mississippi State baseball. And um, they're to be commended for what they've done. And uh, what a great job by our staff, kind of keeping the players engaged. And that was one of the things that I thought was important is uh, as everybody goes to bed Saturday night with not knowing what's happening, you know, it was pretty much told to our kids, hey, be ready to play tomorrow. Be ready to play. So it wasn't like a situation where they weren't – maybe they didn't know for sure, but they at least had the understanding of, hey, when I go to bed tonight, I've got an expectation to play in a ball game tomorrow. And so rather than go cry ourselves to sleep, uh, good job by our staff and leadership for our program to kind of keep everybody engaged. And, again, so many times in that Sunday game we could have just said, you know what, it, things are against us. But they refused to yield, refused to yield. Very, very proud of this group. And, uh, again, where we are right now is uh, pretty much where we expected to be, probably not where we should be. You look back at that Florida series, you feel like we absolutely should have taken that series and probably swept. But it is what it is. So we're now 6-6, six and six, again, with 18 to play. You start working through the numbers here, and it's like, hey, if we can find a way to go 10-6 and six down the stretch, we may put ourselves in a position to host. But uh, right now the main focus has got to be on UAB and getting over this midweek malaise. That's a big thing for us. We, can't, we cannot absorb any more of these uh, you know, non-conference losses. We, 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 got, we need to sweep the remaining uh, midweek games. Uh, there's no doubt about that, including that governor's game against Ole Miss. But uh, it's an interesting dynamic, but uh, I'm super proud of everybody that turned out yesterday. And for all of you that couldn't make it, that uh, you know, maybe voiced your outrage in many respects, uh, I'm tired of having to do that. You know, we had the situation at A&M, and then, uh, then there's this. I just want us to be able to coach and cover baseball, right? And that's how you feel, too. Well, listen, let's get out of here. If you had not done so, go to winthebottomfalls.com, and uh, you can get the newest book, When the Bottom Falls, which is still doing exceptionally well, along with all of my sports titles. That's, uh, you know, Flim Flam, Stark Villains, Alpha Dogs, Dog Pile. And if you're looking for Stark Villains gear, you can find it at StarkVillains.com. Matter of fact, I had a lady yesterday walked up to me wearing a Stark Villain shirt. And she said, of all the days for me to run into you, i got to get a picture for me and my daughter. So there you go. Uh, appreciate you guys repping the brand. And that uh, means so much to me. Uh, and if you hadn't done so, go to TrueRest.com. And you can check all the joys of floating out. It's been a very busy weekend for us. But uh, we have room for you. We, we never pack out every day. We have some very, very busy days. But it's rare that we, we completely book out. Uh, we expect that to happen at some point. But um, we want you to come be a part of our, our family and uh, just follow us on Facebook at True Rest uh, of Starkville. And uh, the phone number is 662-268-7601. My wife is a registered nurse. She can answer any questions you may have about any medical concerns. Uh, but uh, the main thing is we just want to add some value to your life and give you a chance to rest and uh, to remove some stress and irritation from your life, perhaps from chronic pain. Whatever is on you, we may have a solution for you at True Rest. Until next time, let's all live our lives in a way we make more friends than enemies and people can see a difference in the way we live.